Thanks, Jeff. Good morning. Welcome, everybody. Again, I want to echo what Pastor Jeff said. If you're a guest, so glad that you are here. If you're worshiping online with us for the first time, again, we're so excited that you could be a part of this as we begin or continue in this series that we began last week called The Big Story. And in that uh, story, what we're looking at is how the the story of the scriptures of the Old and the New Testament, how they tell this story and they reveal to us the uh, the, the, the greatness of God and this ultimate plan that God has for not only for humanity, but for the all of creation and how we can be in a relationship, how we can connect to this great God. And last week, uh, I began that series by talking about how God put all of creation into place and how the world is not as God intended, though. That while God put it all into place, he gave humanity a choice. And in choosing, our world has become skewed and marred and different than God had intended. And it's because of humanity's choice and continued choices that it is not God's dream for the world. Uh, The challenge I gave you was to read Genesis 1 through 11. And in that, you can see that if you read that, there's this There's graphic stories in there showing uh, humanity and how the choices that uh, people have made are all the same choices that Adam and Eve made, that we want to be like God ourselves. And so that's in Genesis chapters 1 through 11. Chapter 12 takes a shift. And it moves from the story of all of humanity to the story of one person. As uh, Randy on that video shared with us, it's the story of Abraham, how this one man and this one family and soon to be one nation. So if you took up that challenge last week of reading Genesis 1 through 11, this week you can read Genesis 12 through 50. I mean, just jump right in and do it. Uh, You know, you can read a few chapters every day, and this will be the continued saga, continued story, but this now we'll focus on this on this family and on their relationship with God. Uh, so one of the questions that uh, we often ask around here, if you've been in a small group, you have heard us ask this question, how did you start attending Hope? Uh, if you're here in the room, just slip up your hand. Have you ever been asked that question, how did I start attending Hope? Yeah, it's like a common question that we like to ask, and uh, often the answers are uh, inspiring and encouraging, and people will tell us that they were invited by a friend, which again is why we had such a great Easter attendance this last year, because we chose to take the initiative to offer an invitation, and people received that invitation and said yes. Uh, So invitation by a friend. Sometimes people tell us that they were driving by, and they saw all the excitement in the parking lot, and so that uh, drew, drew them in to uh, find out what was going on here. Other times it's they saw a sign or a billboard or they saw some other kind of marketing uh, that we might have used and so they heard about us that way. Sometimes people, it's because uh, uh, they watch us online. They Google searched uh, church in the area, and uh, we are fortunate enough that we come up in the in the top there and people have found us that way. And some of you may be watching now because of that. I started asking a follow-up question Uh, In addition to how did you start attending, I've started asking, why did you start attending Hope? And I find that the why is important. Why were you led to find a church home? And sometimes people will say, I was just searching for something. And they'll say, I didn't know why. And sometimes they even say, I still don't know why but I was searching. See, I think the why is not always clear. Sometimes it's not clear till later, and sometimes it's not clear till much, much later, or maybe even never at all. Sometimes people will say, I had no idea what God was doing until I looked back and went, wow, God, look what you did. And that's because our life is a series of walking into moments of unknown, right? We're always moving forward into the unknown. So I want to explore that theme of unknown today, the idea of what is it like to walk into the unknown. And to do that, we're going to tell the story, and I'm going to continue to echo some of the parts of the story that were shown in our video and read parts of that story as well. And the story begins with an invite 
an invitation to join in something that's unknown. And it's in Genesis chapter 12. It's going to be up on the screen. And the Lord said to Abraham, Abram, Ab- who will soon be renamed Abraham, leave your native country, your relatives, and your father's family, and go to the land that I will show you. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you and make you famous, and you will be a blessing to others. I will bless those who bless you and curse those who treat you with contempt. All the families on earth will be blessed through you. And so the beginning of God's exhaustive plan to rescue humanity begins with this one man named Abraham and his wife Sarah and their decision to follow Yahweh, this new God that they've just met, this unknown God, and challenges them to go to the land that I will show you. So Abraham and Sarah with leave their home so they're now nomads. They have no family. They have no map. They have no clue where they're going. It's a step of faith into this unknown. All Abraham has on his side is a promise to come. A promise to be blessed. Yahweh says, I will bless you and you will be a blessing to others. If you didn't know this, it's, there's some familiar language there that we often say here that, that we are in the process of being conformed to the image of Jesus Christ for the sake of others, right? The, that we're blessed and we want to bless others that for the blessing of others. And so Abraham takes this challenge to go out into the unknown and to follow this unknown God named Yahweh. And now we jump ahead several decades in the story and generations, as Randy shared. And this once childless Abraham and Sarah now have a grandson named Jacob who has 12 sons and several daughters and even some grandchildren. And because of the famine that is taking place in the land, they move to an unknown land of Egypt. And again, you can read that in Genesis chapter 12 through 50. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob's stories. And Abraham's family now stays in Egypt for centuries, and they experience exponential growth. In the history book called Exodus, there are many, uh, uh, there are uh, stories of how the descendants of Abraham now have become a slave labor force of the Egyptian empire. Because empires are built on the backs of slaves. And so Israel is enslaved to Egypt and Israel fuels the Egyptian economy because free labor is required to feed a nation and build an empire. And Moses enters the story and continues this rescue plan that God has for humanity and Israel in particular here in this moment. And so after a dramatic battle between Israel's God Yahweh and the Pharaoh of Egypt, the Israelites are told to walk out of Egypt and head to this unknown place. And so you can read that in Exodus chapters 1 through 13. And so we're moving quickly through the story. And Pharaoh, after telling Israel that they can leave, changes his mind. So the Israelites have quickly packed up. They've quickly uh, about to leave their life of slavery. And there's a brand new day entering the unknown of freedom. But Pharaoh has changed his mind. So after the Israelites have left, they get word that Pharaoh is chasing after them. It's possible that Pharaoh recognized that there would be a potential economic collapse with the loss of this free labor force. And so he brings an army of chariots, which would be the modern day equivalent of a tank. It says that hundreds and hundreds of chariots are brought out as well as the armed forces of Egypt. And now we find the Israelites are trapped by this pursuing army. They have the Red Sea in front of them and and the chariots of Egypt behind them. 
there are people in panic and they have nowhere to go. They are literally between a rock and a hard place. And what do we do when we're in panic? Stupid that you know a lot of answers are coming out, and I, I didn't I didn't expect it to be audience participation, but I'm glad that's great. Glad you're engaged. Glad you're part of that. Uh, that's a good thing. Uh, and and yeah, we do all those things you just shared, and we panic, and we um, we play Monday morning quarterback. At least that's what I do. I start to think, oh, if only I'd done this. If only I'd done that. And that's what happens in this story. Uh, it's going to be on the screen as. Pharaoh approached, the Israelites looked up and they saw them, Egyptians coming at them. They were totally afraid. They cried out in terror to God. These are all the things you all just said, that's what we do, right? And then they told Moses, weren't the cemeteries large enough in Egypt so that you, so that you had to take us out here in the wilderness to die? What have you done to us taking us out of Egypt? Moses, it's all your fault. Back in Egypt, didn't we tell you this would happen? Didn't we tell you, leave us alone here in Egypt. We're better off as slaves in Egypt than as corpses in the wilderness. Uh, I do this thing. My, my, if, if, if Kelly, I, don't, I didn't say this in the last service, so I'm hoping my wife is watch the last service and not this one because when I get home we'll have this conversation at lunch but I do this thing I catastrophize do you know what that means so so the sliding glass door our patio door stopped working and uh, the wheel broke and it's an old door it needed to be replaced anyway but the wheel broke and I went through this oh my this house is falling apart we need to just sell it let's move let's get out of here the patio door is ruined Kelly hears that, and she's like, we got to move? And then I have to get all that out, and then 10 minutes later, I say, all right, I called somebody. I think they're going to be here, and it's going to cost us such and such. And, and then she'll say, don't we have to move? <laughs> like, no, why would you think that? Well, you just said that. And you think I learned, but the same thing happens with the car right? Or the same thing happens with, you name it. For me, I catastrophize, right? I'm doing this, right? I'm, I'm, I'm this. The Israelites are surrounded by unknowns. And when I have the unknowns in my life, I find myself doing the same thing. See, the Israelites, they've got suitcases instead of swords. And they definitely don't have chariots. And they want to turn back. Let's just sell the house. See, they're sure that Pharaoh and his army have won. But don't miss this. This is one of Moses' greatest leadership moments. And it's our takeaway for today. It's up on the screen. Moses spoke to the people. After all of that catastrophizing that they just did, Moses spoke to the people. He said, don't be afraid. Stand firm and watch God do his work of salvation for you today. Take a good look at the Egyptians today, for you're never going to see them again. And so with these Egyptian chariots headed toward them, trapped on every side, he says, don't be afraid. Stand firm and watch God do his work today. I would think we can kind of put that into a easier phrase for us to remember this morning. I think that not fearing and standing firm together could be trust. I would argue that God wants us to hear today and in the days ahead as we walk through unknown moments. Maybe it's career, maybe it's health, maybe it's some other unknown with your finances or maybe it's something silly like a patio door and God wants you to trust and watch God work 
Maybe it's your, there's the unknown of, I'm trying to figure this spiritual thing out, and I can't. And I don't look like that person, I don't act like that person, and I'm just figuring out what it means to follow Jesus. Maybe God wants you to just trust and watch God work. See, the Israelites had the Passover, and during that Passover, they were introduced to who Yahweh was, and it marked the end of slavery for Israel. But the Red Sea, the Red Sea was the Israelites facing the unknown and entering the unknown and initiating the beginning of of a new life with God. You see, we can sing a song like, I see evidence of your goodness all over my life, all over my life, all over my life, and still on Monday say, God, where are you? All over my life, all over my life, all over my life. But we can trust and watch God work. The the Exodus story is, Moment after moment after moment after moment, they are facing and entering the unknown and learning who this God is that they're following over and over and over again is the story of Exodus. It's woven into their history, this story of trusting and watching God work. So that story that I just shared is referenced by the Apostle Paul. He was writing, uh, Paul was a missionary who built churches up and down uh, uh, the Mediterranean Sea area, and he uh, was a follower of Jesus in the first century. And after he would plant these churches, he would often write letters to them and tell them some things about their faith and how they could grow and challenge them and different things. So he had created this or built this church in the city of Corinth, and he wrote a letter to them years later. And in that, he said something that I find fascinating as it's connected to this story of the uh, Israelites and their travels through the Red Sea and also through the, towards, through the wilderness. And so uh, it's not on the screen. I just want you to hear it. Paul says, I don't want you to forget, dear brothers and sisters, about our ancestors in the wilderness long ago. All of them were guided by a cloud that moved ahead of them, and all of them walked through the sea on dry ground. And in the cloud and in the sea, Paul says this, all of them were baptized as followers of Moses. All of them, he says, ate the same spiritual food. That's the manna that fell from heaven. And all of them drank the same spiritual water. That's one time Moses struck a rock and water came up for the Israelites. And Paul says, for they drank from the spiritual rock that traveled with them, and that rock was Jesus, Paul says. See, for Paul, Israel was baptized by this spirit of God, and the walk away from Egypt through the Red Sea was like a baptism for them. And even more than just like a baptism, Paul was saying that for for the same Jesus that is with the Corinthian church, Paul says, the same Jesus that is with us today is the same Jesus that was with the Israelites even then. So, Just like last week, the creation story, John in John 1 says the word was God and the word was with God and the word was present. Jesus was present at creation. Here we find Jesus is present in this moment as the Israelites are crossing through the Red Sea, that they pass from the dry lands of Egypt into this unknown land of freedom. And God's rescue always leads to this unknown process of transformation. Trust and watch God work. And it's going to look different for every person. I was talking to someone the other day, earlier, actually the end of this week, and we were talking about spiritual life and talking about growing in our faith and and his thought was, and his comment was, I, 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 don't, it, I, I, don't, I don't 
say the things you say. I don't do the things you say. He's talking about me. I'm like, probably it's good. <laughs> but my experience and my personality and my faith story is different than your faith story. And each of us here, each of you online, it's as different as our fingerprints. That's why we talk about it as a process. I think the common thing for us is that we all walk into moments of unknown. It's a theme that runs through these stories that we're seeing. Adam and Eve started in the garden, but then in chapter 3, we're sent out into the unknown. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are called to follow God into the unknown of this promised blessing. Moses then is uh, challenged to go to Egypt and is introduced to Pharaoh and, and the Israel, and he introduces, excuse me, introduces Pharaoh and the Israelites to this new God, this unknown God named Yahweh. And Israel then walks through, uh, out of Egypt and slavery into this unknown relationship with Yahweh and this unknown promise of land. There's so much of life is unknown. And in the 21st century, we try to, we try to um, manage the unknown. So if I asked you, what are you doing on Monday, tomorrow, we'd all pull out our iPhones and we say, well, here's what's on my agenda. But really, we don't know. We can even say, in August, I'm doing this. But really, just because it's in your calendar, we don't know. We want to believe we can control that, but we don't know. There's so many what ifs, so many unknowns in life, and it's scary and it's overwhelming, and it's uncertain, and it's also exciting. Because if you knew every moment from today till your last day, how boring of a world that would be. And that's why, that's one of the reasons I think God is comfortable moving us toward the unknown because it's when we're in the unknown when we get to know God best. It's when we can trust and watch God work. And then we can sing, only ever good, only ever good. You've only ever been good to me. So Paul the same Paul that wrote a letter to the Corinthians was actually quite a prolific writer. He wrote a lot of letters, and he wrote another letter to a church in Ephesus, and I want to wrap up with this. It's, uh, it's going to be, this, I think this one's on the screen. I might surprise you. Yes, it is. Uh, so Ephesians chapter 2. Now God has us where he wants us. Let me say that one more time. Now God has us where he wants us. Is that good to hear? You may be facing all sorts of uncertainty. God has us where he wants us. With all the time in this world and the next to shower grace and kindness upon us in Christ Jesus. You may feel like you're trapped by time, but God has all the time in the world. Paul says saving is all his idea and all his work. All we do, oh, this sounds so familiar, doesn't it? All we do is trust him enough to let him do it. Trust and watch God work. Because it's God's gift, Paul says, from start to finish. We don't play the major role. If we did, we'd probably go around bragging that we'd done the whole thing ourselves, right? Oh, sorry, I added ourselves. The whole thing. No, we neither make nor save ourselves. God does both the making and the saving. He creates each of us by Christ Jesus to join him in the work he does, the good work he has gotten ready for us to do, work we had better be doing. So the challenge today, trust and watch God work. But no, it's not, it's not a magic pill. It's not even a one-time prayer. It is a process. And with all the time in this world and the next to shower grace and kindness upon us, 
God chooses to work in us and through us. And for each of us, it's going to look different. We say that discipleship is the process of being conformed. It's the process. It's not a one-time prayer. It's not a magic bullet. It's not a magic pill. It's a process. And our role in this, trust and watch God work. Paul said, saving is all his idea and all his work, and all we do is trust him enough to let him do it. Always moving away from what's harming us towards God. Moving away from slavery, moving away from sin, moving towards God. Transformed, conforming to the image of Jesus Christ. And he creates each of us by Christ Jesus to join him in the work he does. Someone at the end of the last service said, I think God's calling me. I don't know what a calling is, but I think God's calling me. <laughs> and I said, well, let's talk about that. I said, you know, it's kind of what Jesus does. He invites us into a relationship with him and then invites us to build the kingdom with him. He creates each of us by Christ Jesus to join him in the work he does, the good work he has gotten ready for us to do, work we had better be doing for the sake of others, a blessing to others. We get to build the kingdom with God. Will you stand with me for closing prayer? And so God, I pray that we would learn to trust and watch you work. That God, like the Israelites, we would, uh, while we feel that we're being pressed by an enemy coming towards us possibly, and there's an unknown future ahead, God, I pray that we would learn to trust and watch you work. And that, God, you would move in and through us. That, God, we would see our lives being conformed and transformed to look like you. And that, God, we would listen for your voice and we would see where we can be a blessing to the world around us. To see where we can allow our lives to bring goodness and life and joy into our world and into our workplaces. And God, I pray that that would be our desire, that would be our challenge, God, that that would be our, um, uh, our work moving forward. That while we don't know what tomorrow will be, God, we will trust you with our tomorrow. And God, I pray that that would be our prayer. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Have a blessed day. Amen.